Friday, the 13th. You may only see it once. The original Friday the 13th was an independent film from Georgetown Productions, made on an initial budget of around $500,000. Then, the major Hollywood studio Paramount Pictures picked up the domestic distribution rights and gave the film a wide theatrical release. It performed beyond anyone's wildest expectations, pulling in $40 million in North America alone and becoming one of the highest grossing films of 1980. It was the second biggest film of the summer, behind The Empire Strikes Back. Impressive. The most impressive. With a return on investment like that, getting a sequel off the ground as soon as possible was a no-brainer. But how do you make a follow-up to a film where nearly every character was murdered and the villain was decapitated? We're about to find out, because we're digging into the making of Friday the 13th Part 2 with this episode of What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to you straight about Jason. His body was never recovered from the lake after he drowned. Directed by Sean S. Cunningham, from a screenplay by Victor Miller, Friday the 13th starred Betsy Palmer as Mrs. Voorhees, who was working as a cook at Camp Crystal Lake when her young son, Jason, drowned there. More than 20 years after Jason's death, the son of the camp's owners tried to open the place again, so Mrs. Voorhees killed him and the new counselors he hired all except one. A counselor named Alice Hardy, played by Adrian King, was able to fight back against Mrs. Voorhees and cut off her head with a machete. Alice was safe, but Cunningham wanted to throw one last jump scare at the audience. So he added a scene, presumably a nightmare, where the long dead Jason jumps out of Crystal Lake to pull Alice out of her canoe. <laughs> This moment was just put in there as a joke to the audience, a way to startle them before they left the theater. And Jason as a character hadn't existed. He was just this, he was this gag at the end with, the, with, with Ari Lehman coming up out of the water. But it ended up serving as the foundation for a franchise. Friday the 13th was released on May 9th, 1980. By July, Paramount and the producers at Georgetown were in agreement that they needed to make a sequel. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Friday the 13th, part two. The body count continues. Filming was scheduled to begin in September. They just needed to figure out the story. Cunningham and Miller suggested using the title Friday the 13th for an anthology series. Every year, a new movie would be released that would take place around Friday the 13th. There'd be no story connections between the films and no returning characters. John Carpenter would later suggest doing the same thing with the Halloween franchise. The anthology idea was shot down in both counts. The higher-ups wanted Friday the 13th Part 2 to be a direct sequel, and the Georgetown producers, particularly a man named Phil Scudari, insisted that Jason be at the center of the film. This is the point at which some members of the first film's creative team started distancing themselves from the sequel. Cunningham didn't want to direct something that was going to be too similar to the movie he had just made. Miller didn't want to write about Jason. Jason was dead. Jason Voorhees is dead. He wasn't. There was no point to the first movie. Special effects artist Tom Savini agreed. He thought the idea of making the sequel about Jason was so dumb, he chose to work on a different camp slasher movie, The Burning, instead. The first choice to replace Savini was Stan Winston, but he was too busy doing anything other than help create the severed head of Mrs. Voorhees. He suggested that the filmmakers get in contact with legendary effects artist Dick Smith, who was a hero of Savini's, and Smith pointed them in the direction of Carl Fullerton, whose work was impressive enough that it was believed he would be the next Savini. <laughs> Georgetown didn't have to look far to find replacements for Cunningham and Miller. Steve Miner had been working with Cunningham since being a production assistant and assistant editor on the 1972 Wes Craven film The Last House on the Left, which Cunningham had produced. He was an associate producer, production manager, and second unit director on Friday the 13th, and when Georgetown asked him to produce the sequel, he decided to pitch himself as the director as well. He figured he could do as good a job as anyone else would and felt he understood what horror fans and the audience had enjoyed from the first movie and would want in part two. 
Cunningham agreed to vouch for Miner as director, as long as Miner hired his wife, Susan E. Cunningham, as editor. The deal was made. A writer named Ron Kurtz had done some uncredited rewrites on the first film and added the scene with the motorcycle cop, so he was hired to write the script for the sequel. The title on the script he wrote was simply Jason. Scudari worked closely with Kurtz while he was crafting the script, giving him ideas during their regular meetings, suggesting kills and acting them out in the middle of busy restaurants. One thing Kurtz didn't fully write out was the opening of the film, which finds Alice Hardy is staying in the town of Crystal Lake two months after she stopped Mrs. Voorhees' killing spree. Adrian King wasn't given a copy of the script when she arrived on set. She was just told to improvise. Come on, Mom, we've been through all of this before. I just have to put my life back together, and this is the only way I know how. While we're catching up with Alice, we're also aware that someone is lurking outside her house, and our first glimpse of Jason comes when we see his legs crossing the street in front of Alice's place. Not only is this the first thing we see of the adult Jason, <laughs> It's also the only time in the franchise that Jason was played by a woman. Those legs belong to costume designer Ellen Lutter. After an extended sequence that includes what may be the fastest shower in history, Alice finds Mrs. Voorhees' severed head in her refrigerator, and the dead woman's son is standing right behind her, holding an ice pick. Alice survived the first movie, but she doesn't even make it 13 minutes into part two. Different reasons have been given for why Alice isn't in the movie longer. Some say the decision makers wanted to focus on new characters. Some say King's agent asked for too much money. But King has said she requested that she be given a short amount of screen time in the sequel because she was being tormented by a stalker in her personal life at this point. I had someone who came into my life, a very bizarre situation. It was a person who was obsessed. Once Alice has been killed, the story jumps ahead five years. A man named Paul Holt has opened a place called the Pakanak Counselor Training Center across the lake from the now abandoned Camp Crystal Lake. Locals disagree with his decision, feeling that he's asking for trouble by opening a new place so close to the old camp. Things have been quiet for five years and that's the way we want to keep it. But that doesn't stop counselors from arriving for their training course. But the locals, including the returning character Crazy Ralph, still hanging around to tell people they're doomed if they go out near the lake, are right to be concerned. You're all doomed. As soon as the counselors get set up at Pakanak, people start getting picked off one by one. The first person to get killed at the counselor training center is Crazy Ralph, who didn't heed his own warning. To bring Pakanak to the screen, Miner and his crew were able to find an awesome location in Kent, Connecticut. Unfortunately, the locations from this movie really do seem to have been cursed. It's got a death curse! The only ones still around are the places that stand in for the town of Crystal Lake. The phone booth characters are shown using isn't there anymore. It was fake to begin with, but the buildings remain. Sadly, the house Alice was staying in has since been demolished. The bar characters go to burned to the ground soon after filming was completed. And a few years ago, someone bought the campground and took out the cabins. A house now stands on the spot where Pakanak Lodge used to be. You can still visit the locations from most of the other Friday the 13th movies, but there's not much left to visit from this one. Camp Crystal Lake has changed. Miner was aiming high when he went into production on Friday the 13th Part 2. He set out to make the most terrifying film ever, and he felt he could accomplish this while sticking to the structure of the first movie. But he wanted to make sure his film would top its predecessor by having more realistic characters and better dialogue. The sequel also had a higher budget, allowing Miner to give it a more polished look with more camera movement. They even had a steady cam to use for this one. Kurtz was successful in writing a good bunch of likable characters, and while viewers often pick on the acting in 80s horror movies, What are you kids doing out here? Miner was able to assemble a solid cast for this one. A lot of counselors show up at Pakanak, but several of them are background extras. In addition to Paul, who is played by John Fury, the ones we focus on are the counselors who will have a reason to stay behind at Pakanak while Paul goes into town with everyone else to celebrate a successful first day of training. They are Bill Randolph and Marta Kalber as Jeff and his girlfriend Sandra, who gets them in trouble when she becomes fascinated with the story of Camp Crystal Lake and wants to see the place for herself. After a police officer catches them wandering too close to the old camp, Paul punishes them by making them stay at Pakanak that night. Kirsten Baker plays Terry, who doesn't leave because her little dog Muffin has gone missing. Muffin? Russell Todd plays Scott, who stays at Pakanak because he wants some extra time to creep on Terry. The producers at Georgetown requested that there be a character in a wheelchair, and that turned out to be Mark, played by Tom McBride. 
He doesn't go to town with others because he doesn't want to spoil their good time. And Vicky, played by Lauren Marie Taylor, has a crush on Mark, so she wants to stay by his side. While the others are away, Jason wipes out all of these people. A notable counselor who doesn't get killed is the wisecracking Ted, played by Stu Charno. Ted survives this movie by staying in town and drinking all night. Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. <laughs> And of course, any slasher movie needs a heroine. The final girl, replacing Alice in that role is Ginny Field, who is named in tribute to Friday the 13th Part 1 and 2 production designer Virginia Field, a counselor who's in a relationship with Paul. Ginny is studying child psychology, which turns out to be helpful when she and Paul return to Pakenak to find that the legendary Jason Voorhees has killed everybody there. Played by Amy Steele, Ginny is one of the most popular heroines in this series because fans admire her intelligence and the fact that she is able to gain some insight into how Jason's mind works. Well, what would it be like today? Some kind of out of control psychopath? A child trapped in a man's body? Steele's performance was so well received, the filmmakers wanted her to come back for Friday the 13th Part 3, but she wanted to make what she considered more important movies, which didn't include slasher sequels, and wanted more money than the producers were willing to offer. So she decided not to reprise her role of Ginny, a decision she would come to regret later on. That was great. It was fun. You know, maybe I should have kept going part three, four, five, six, but it was good. Steele has since largely stepped away from acting and become a therapist in real life. It's more fun using that child psychology on you. You're such a sucker for it. We have to address the fact that Jason, a dead little boy in the first movie, is now a grown man, alive and homicidal. Mrs. Voorhees was trying to avenge his death, and now he's killing people to avenge her death. How does this make sense? Well, the movie doesn't try to give any direct answers, which is for the best. The history of Jason and his mother is told as a creepy campfire story by Paul. He tells us that Jason's body was never recovered from the lake, and that some believe he didn't die, that he has been surviving on his own in the wilderness, we are shown that Jason has put together his own shack in the woods, where the centerpiece is a shrine to his mother's head. Miner believed that Jason survived the drowning incident and that the child Alice was grabbed by at the end of the first movie wasn't the real Jason. It was a figment of her imagination. The boy, Jason. Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. But there is no one in part two to confirm whether Jason survived and his mother didn't know it, or if he rose from the grave after his mother was killed. It's open to interpretation. Fans can come up with their own theories, like Ginny does. After hearing the campfire story, Ginny begins wondering what Jason would be like if he really exists. She feels sympathy for him. His mother was the only person he knew, his only friend. She understands why he would feel driven to kill for her, and that's how she is able to beat Jason in the end. Jason, mother is talking to you! Jason has the look of someone who has been living off the wilderness in this film. He doesn't have his iconic hockey mask yet. He doesn't get that until part three. Here, he wears a sack over his head, with a hole cut in it for his one good eye to peer out of. Some have said that this was inspired by the look of the killer in the 1976 film The Town That Dreaded Sundown, and it is quite similar. Friday the 13th Part 2 was already in production by the time David Lynch's movie The Elephant Man was released in October of 1980, and that film also features a disfigured character who wears a bag over his head, with one hole cut in it so he can see. When Miner saw this, he said it was an unfortunate coincidence that Jason looked like the Elephant Man. That's probably why he ditches the sack in the next movie. Various crew members put on the Jason costume throughout the film, like Ellen Lutter did for that shot of his legs. Miner initially offered the role to Tasso Stavarkas, an actor and stuntman who had also been Savini's assistant in the effects department on the first Friday, but he turned it down. So the role ended up going to Warrington Gillette, an actor who had stunt training and first got involved with the project when he thought he had a shot at playing Paul. So they said, would you like to be Jason? So I said, hey, listen, I'll, I'm happy to do anything uh, you want me to do. Instead, he found himself buried under prosthetics that took six hours to apply so he could play the silent role of Jason. Gillette understandably hated wearing that makeup. New mouth, new the, new the. They, they closed this eye off, which is very painful if you close an eye off for like 12 hours at a time and he and Steele both hated filming the scene where an unmasked Jason lunges at Ginny through a window, a scene that had to be shot multiple times before they got it right. I was angry and I wanted to kill somebody. What, he said we have to do that scene again. I thought, oh my God. It, it was horrific. So Gillette was eventually replaced by stuntman Steve Daskowitz, 
who also went by the name Steve Dash. He wore the sack mask to pursue Ginny throughout the climactic chase scene, a sequence that's packed with scares, stunts, and even a little bit of urine. The producers wanted a character to urinate in fear during the movie, and that person ended up being Ginny. She hides from Jason under a bed, and while the killer searches for her, a rat comes, walking up to her face. The urine flows, giving away her hiding spot. Dash got very banged up filming Jason's confrontation with Ginny and had to make some trips to the hospital. During the filming of one scene, he broke some of his ribs by falling on Jason's pickaxe. And later, he had to get stitches in a finger when Steele accidentally sliced him with a machete. The chase sequence ends in Jason's shack, where Ginny figures out she'd be able to trick Jason by putting on the sweater Mrs. Voorhees was wearing when she was killed. A sweater that happens to be there by her severed head. When Jason sees Ginny in his mom's clothes, he has visions of her talking to him. Betsy Palmer reprising the role of Mrs. Voorhees in a cameo. Palmer's cameo was filmed by Steve Miner's old friend, Wes Craven. Since Gillette is credited as Jason Voorhees and Daskowitz is credited as Jason's stunt double, it took decades for Dash to get the proper recognition for his contributions to Friday the 13th Part 2. But fans eventually became aware of just how much work he did on the film, and he was able to interact with them at conventions for many years before he passed away in 2018. The Jason of Part 2 is different than the hockey mask version of the character. He's smaller and clumsier, but Dash did a great job of playing this bloodthirsty woodsman, Jason. Unfortunately, the movie doesn't feature much of the blood that Jason spills. The ratings board had received a huge amount of backlash for letting the first Friday the 13th get by with an R rating after just a few seconds had been trimmed from the kill scenes, so they were much tougher on the sequels. Minor had to submit part two to the ratings board nearly 10 times, whittling 54 seconds out of the death scenes along the way before the sequel got its R rating. Every single on-screen kill had to be cut down to some degree. The effects work that was supposed to earn Carl Fullerton the reputation of being on the level of Tom Savini wasn't seen by the audience. And for almost 40 years, the uncut gore footage was believed to be lost forever. It wasn't until Scream Factory was gathering material for the Friday the 13th franchise box set they released in 2020 that it was discovered Fullerton still had a VHS copy of the kills he and his crew created for the film. Thanks to Scream Factory, fans have finally had the chance to see Friday the 13th Part 2 death scenes in all their gory glory. Over the years, some genre fans have noticed that a few of the kills in the first two Friday the 13th movies are oddly similar to kills in the 1971 Italian film A Bay of Blood, which was directed by Mario Bava and is also known as Twitch of the Death Nerve. In particular, scenes of people with axes or machetes stuck in their faces and the double impalement of Jeff and Sandra look like they could have been lifted right out of Bava's movie. Sean S. Cunningham has said that any similarities between the films is purely coincidental, as he didn't see A Bay of Blood until years after the Friday movies were released. But others involved with these movies were definitely aware of Bava's film before the first two Fridays went into production. Martin Katrosser, who worked as script supervisor on the first two movies and co-wrote the screenplays for parts three and five, is such a huge fan of Bava's work that he even named his son Mario Bava Katrosser. When Kurtz was hired to write Friday the 13th part two, he and Katrosser felt they should model the kills after the ones in A Bay of Blood. And Katrosser even thought the movie should include a dedication to Bava who had passed away the month before Friday the 13th was released in the end credits. That suggestion was shot down by the producers. So there's no denying that multiple people involved with the early Fridays knew they were following in the footsteps of Bava's film. Friday the 13th part two didn't deliver the amount of bloodshed that had been seen in either A Bay of Blood or Friday the 13th, but it was a success when it reached theaters on April 30th, 1981, nine days short of the first film's one year anniversary. The day you count on for terror is not over. Made on a budget of just over $1 million, Friday the 13th Part 2 earned almost $22 million at the box office. This was substantially less than the first movie's take, but still a good return on investment. It did have a bigger opening weekend than its predecessor had, then had a steeper drop-off. Exactly why it didn't do as well as the first movie isn't quite clear. Were fans disappointed that the kills had been watered down? Was it because the market was flooded with slasher movies in 1981? There were a lot of them released that year, but Friday the 13th Part 2 is one of the best. Whether or not Minor was successful in his endeavor to make Part 2 better than the first movie is up to individual fans to decide. Just like it's up to us to come up with our own answers as to what really happened to Paul and Muffin. Minor certainly made a worthy follow-up and was able to turn Jason Voorhees, that dead little boy, into a believable, threatening slasher. The film takes the viewer on a creepy, fun, fast-paced ride, 
introducing us to likable characters, and then knocking them off in entertainingly shocking ways. It's a thrilling and important chapter in the legend of Jason Voorhees, and when Miner came back to direct Friday the 13th Part 3, he took the character a step beyond and turned him into the hockey mask-wearing icon we know and love.